This Week in Startups is brought to you by Silicon Valley Bank, who has formed the COVID-19 Global Impact and Innovation Fund in partnership with Founders Pledge. This fund will deliver resources directly to organizations that can help make the most immediate impact in the fight against COVID-19. Learn more at svb.com slash impact. And LinkedIn Jobs. A business is only as strong as its people, and every hire matters. Go to linkedin.com slash twist and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. Hey, everybody. It's This Week in Startups, and we are here taping during the coronavirus and quarantine. Just want to give a shout out and thank you to everybody who's working on the front lines. Uh, and I know some people who work on the front lines actually have no choice. They need to make a living. Yeah. And so to those people, you know, I call you a hero, but you have no choice but to be there. So in a way, I, I understand you're a victim. You have, you're a victim of circumstance, but it doesn't uh, take away from the respect we all have for you. Uh, delivering the Uber Eats, delivering the DoorDash, security, janitors, doctors, interns, nurses, everybody on the front lines. Thank you uh, for what you're doing for us. And as we sit here uh, thinking about all the lives that got saved for this incredible effort, uh, it's a tragedy that 50,000 people at the taping of this, I think we're at 50,000 today. Um, and this is just a real tragedy, um, but it could have been 500,000. And yeah. so we have to sort of thank ourselves uh, for doing a good job of staying home, wear your masks, social distance. It's working, obviously, and better days are coming. With that, uh, now that we've gotten people's lives and addressed that issue, livelihoods matter too. 26 million people are unemployed, unemployed as of this week. Yeah. It's some scary stuff. Um, and uh, we're going to talk about one of the emerging jobs in the world. And that job is playing video games. Now, if I had known this in the 80s when I had my Atari, and my PC Junior. Uh, th this I never thought anybody would play video games for a living. I knew people made them for a living. Um, but my guest today is Delane Parnell. He is Delane on the Twitter, D-E-L-A-N-E, -E, and he's the CEO, founder of Play Versus, P-L-A-Y-V-S dot com. You can check it out. Um, Delane, welcome to the program. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, now, your company, from what I understand, is designed or was designed with the idea of creating sports leagues. We call them esports leagues, I guess, and esports leagues, and maybe trying to tap into the high school player. Um, so maybe you could explain right up front what is playversus.com um, and how did it get started? Yes. Yeah, so uh, our vision at Playversus is to build, um, you know, a single. Uh, competitive community uh, for people who want to play video games competitively or otherwise known as esports online. Um, you know, we started our business by building out um, the competitive league around high school esports uh, in a way that's uh, very similar and sanctioned, um, uh, like high school football, basketball, baseball, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the way that we operate that is that we not only provide the league infrastructure, but we handle scheduling. We provide the sort of general foundational infrastructure by, you know, working directly with the game publishers, building out the technical integration to make the to enable that play, um, partner with the state associations to sanction the sport. Uh, and so we sort of provide that opportunity for high schools to build teams and, and players to compete. Um, and we also do that for college now, too. And so started the business two years ago um, while we have obviously greater ambitions. Right now, we're we're known as the company that builds uh, the official high school and collegiate esports leagues. H how do you make money? Do the do the high schools or individuals just pay a ten dollars a month per person, like a Netflix subscription, consumer subscriptions, or is it enterprise where the school pays to put their students on it? How do you make money? Sure. Yeah. So we so we offer uh, multiple seasons every year, every school year, two seasons within two four month seasons every school year, and we charge sixty four dollars per player that participates uh, per season. Wow. And so good model. Uh, that's 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 you know generally paid for by the um, by the school. Anecdotally, we do know that like you know parents will give the money to the school and and then yeah. the school will make a one time payment though. And just ballpark. I know you guys have raised a lot of money of late. Is is this something that you know, thousands of people, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are participating in now? Yeah, look, we're, we're, uh, we've operated the business now for 21 months. I started the business in January 2018. 
Um, but the, the product's been live since October 2018. Uh, we're in uh, 47 states. 20 of those states are sanctioned, meaning, you know, esports is treated with the same respect and recognition as basketball, football, baseball, et cetera. Um, we have, you know, tons of schools, um, thousands of schools participate in. Um, uh, we have tens of thousands of players participating and over wow. 100,000 players on our wait list. 100,000 on the wait list. So at 60 bucks a pop, yeah. So this business is doing millions of dollars a year. It's a real business. How many people work at the company now? Yeah, we're a pretty small company, um, not by design, um, but uh, we're we're fifty something people today. Wow! Um, and so, how did schools decide to make this and recognize it as a sport? That seems to me to be one of those hurdles um, that would stop investors from wanting to invest in the company because. I thought the schools looked at this as a distraction and something that was keeping kids up and actually a negative. Uh, and am I right in that assessment? And how did you overcome that objection? Because if half the schools have embraced it, does that mean the other half have either are indifferent or are they actually against this as an activity that schools should support? Because when I was in school, they hated the idea that we were wasting time playing computer and playing video games. Sure. Yeah. So on the investor holder, just to answer that first, um, Look, we, we'd already had to deal with the NFHS, uh, which is uh, the National Federation of State High School Athletic Associations. They're essentially the NCAA of high schools. They're in the same office as the NCAA based in Indianapolis. And they've written the rules and governed high school sports and activities for the past 100 years. Um, and so what that means is they have these local offices, otherwise known as state associations, one in each state. Um, that they work with um, to um, sanction or recognize certain sports and activities, write the rules for them, um, create the structures for them. And then the states then deploy them um, into their markets um, and they operate state leagues, or otherwise known as state championships for these different sports and activities. We partner with the NFHS in January of 2018. Um, to be their exclusive provider uh, for esports, um, everything online, offline, tournament, ex exhibition, uh, season, uh, competitions, um, and uh, and you know we sort of leveraged that to go out and raise our our first round of funding because that gave us exclusive access to ninety three percent of the schools in the country. Um, and uh, in terms of you know how you know any objective objections, excuse me, to esports, um, look, it's. Uh, the reality is there's 60 million kids in high school um, today, but only 8 million actually participate in sports. It's not necessarily an interest or a capability thing. It's that sports aren't scalable, right? So 50% of the population um, are unable to, to compete within these communities because there's only so many roster spots, right? Whether it's, but That never made know, sense to me. I, I didn't understand that in high school. I was like, well, if you could only have 15 people on the basketball team, why don't you just start five basketball teams and have five yeah, teams look, within the school and then run your own tournaments in the school? And uh, you could have people move up and down through them. I mean, it makes no sense. I think we had two, right? JV and... Yeah, so there's freshman JV uh, varsity across boys and girls. Yeah, look, I think uh, that's a, that's certainly a fair point. Um, um, but that's just tradition. Um, uh, you know, schools, schools uh, and high school sports specifically, youth sports, um, and just, you know, the sports community in general, they they, they make decisions based on legacy and tradition. Um, and, and so... You know, wow. Uh, the only way today to like add more sports teams to a sport, especially at sort of peak scale, is just to add more schools. And we know that that's not that's not a trend that's happening. And so, um, you know, we looked at esports as an opportunity to engage not only those eight million who already play sports, but more importantly, engage that eight million who do who doesn't. Um, give them an opportunity to um, to find community within the school to compete um, in something that they care about, to be recognized for their talents. Um, and educators, they want that. Like that, you know, they're like they're very motivated to give kids opportunity to put kids on an improved life does anybody to, like any school say no this isn't for us i'm just curious if they or if that's just totally flipped because everybody's got kids at home and they recognize that this takes some level of skill and it, it does have some level of mastery some of these games are like playing chess i mean other ones the shooters i'm not sure if i have an analogy for that but some of them are very strategic yeah, many of them are strategic and multiplayer and team focused and require a deep level of understanding of the game and a lot of tactical um, ability to be able to execute well. We, we, you know, early on, I think there was uh, an education barrier. And we've certainly um, started to remove that barrier and build confidence around esports and its impact um, over the last 21 months of just operating our product live. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's actually not that many objections to our business, we, we haven't had people, you know, sort of step up and say, 
we don't want this in our school or we don't want this in our state. You know what the uh, if anything, um, you know, the educators that we work with through the NFHS and the state associations and the districts and schools that we're, we're activated in they're they're all about how can we help you get this to more schools uh, and reach more kids because, you know, they recognize the impact that this has on kids. And the reality is like, look, kids are already spending eight hours uh, a, a week, if not more, playing video games at home, obviously. And, and when this, you said this eight hours, I was waiting for you to say a day. I mean, no, I I mean, so so certainly there's some outliers there, but I think the average is 72 percent of uh, American high school teens, you know, spend eight, eight and a half hours. That's uh, the average. What does somebody who's competitive spend? I got to spend at least five hours a day. I'm certainly they're probably playing five to eight hours a day uh, easily. Yeah. Wow. If not more. Yeah. If if you're a professional, I'd imagine it could be eight to 12 hours. So you get done with school at 233, get on your rig three till, I don't know, midnight. Get nine yeah, hours look, hopefully, in. hopefully our kids are one doing their homework first, <laughs> um, getting some physical uh, exercise in, uh, and then maybe they're spending a few hours uh, a day after after all of that is said and done with parental consent to you know plan plan at home. But uh, but the way that esports is operated in the high school environment is very similar to to basketball and football and other sports. And so there's a there's a coach or multiple coaches at a school who oversee the program. There's support from administration. There's a, a dedicated facility within the campus, which could just be a room right with a bunch of computers set up. Kids often have their own dedicated setup with their own peripherals, um, and so they practice. Uh, through play versus against other schools and they also uh, play their league matches, you know, on play versus competing against other schools. And they do that all within the confinement of their respective school campuses. All right. When uh, we get back consent. from this quick break, I want you to explain how a kid from Detroit who was uh, working in cell phone stores, as I understand it, uh, wound up meeting one of the uh, top incubators and got funded and has now raised, t- raised tens of millions of dollars for this and moved to Los Angeles, which is kind of the heart of the esports movement when we get back on this game of startups. As we navigate unprecedented times, Silicon Valley Bank believes that collective action is the best way to overcome the challenges we're up against. And boy, are we up against some challenges. This is why Silicon Valley Bank, alongside Founders Pledge, has formed the COVID-19 Global Impact and Innovation Fund. By mobilizing the innovation community, this fund will directly deliver resources to organizations around the world that can help make immediate impact. Silicon Valley Bank has made an initial $1 million investment to the fund, very nice, for this very critical work. And they invite you to join them by helping those in need. For 35 years, Silicon Valley Bank has supported countless innovators with a passion for finding solutions and remains committed to helping our communities overcome the challenges we're up against. And Silicon Valley Bank firmly believes that the best ideas often thrive when extraordinary problems require extraordinary solutions. And I believe that as well. And I use Silicon Valley Bank and I love working with them. So here is your call to action. To learn more about Silicon Valley Bank's COVID-19 Global Impact and Innovation Fund and find out how you can donate, please visit svb.com slash impact. Once again, please go donate. I'm going to go donate right now svb.com slash impact i-m-p-a-c-t thanks again silicon valley bank for providing amazing support to founders and uh, helping people get get through this incredible crisis that we're uh, suffering through okay let's get back to this amazing episode all right delane parnell is here d-e-l-a-n-e on the twitter ceo and founder of play versus you can go visit at playversus.com if you want to play video games as your after school uh activity or maybe in college uh yeah get your school to sign up so how did this whole thing start i i I know uh that uh you were you're from detroit uh, which has actually got a little bit of a startup town going on there uh just getting started but you eventually met somebody very famous in the industry and then you wound up uh collaborating with them and moving uh to los angeles which is where i think esports is kind of centered these days uh socal so tell me the story how did this all get started yeah, so so just briefly, I think background is super important. Um, born and raised in Detroit, grew up in the Jeffries Projects, then the west side of Detroit, raised by a single mother um, uh, because my father was uh, murdered before I was born. Um, and look, you know, um, my mom and my aunt uh, and some other, you know, uh, family members, uh, they, I guess, you know, assumed that I had a natural knack for business and entrepreneurship um, and they would buy me 
magazines, um, like business magazines, Forbes, Inc., you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and they would make me read them and they would sort of quiz me on them and they would just expose me to opportunities outside of, you know, uh, the streets or, you know, being an athlete. Uh, and it was, it was very unusual, I think, in our family because they didn't do that with anyone else. Like they certainly, you know, identify what other people's passions were and, and tried to double down on that. But for me in particular, like it was business. And it, so they sort of really doubled down on, um, you know, this knack that I have for entrepreneurship and the hustle that that came with that. Um, and my mom uh, got me a job at the cell phone store um, when I was 13. Um, and this guy, Sam, who owned the cell phone store, just took me under his wing, uh, taught me everything about business, taught me about management, sales, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and yeah, eventually I went on to, to own some Metro PCS stores when I was in high school and I would basically go to school, um, you know, get out at like two fifteen. um, uh, you know, before I had a car, you know, a friend would take me or I would take this bus and sort of walk a mile, um, get to the store get there maybe by three o'clock or three, three fifteen. I got to stop work. you for one second there. You just dropped that you owned a cell phone store when you were in high school. Just pause for a second there. How does a high school person wind up getting a cell phone store? Did your rich uncle gift it to you? How did you get a cell phone store? Yeah, I wish I had a rich uncle. Me too. Um, uh, yeah, you know, it'd be my, I'd probably be a billionaire already today. <laughs> no, I think, uh, um, no, look, I was, you know, I was, first off, I was working extremely hard. I, I basically stopped playing sports, stopped doing anything outside of business and work. Um, 13 onward, saved, you know, mostly every penny that I had, um, you know, reinvested that money into different, you know, other hustles, whether it be my homies who worked at shoe stores, you know, I would give them money to buy shoes and then we would resell them and I would take a healthy well, margin. Flipping. My brother. Yeah, Gary I mean, we were doing everything. flipping. Yo, it's we real. uh my 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 step pops owned uh uh he still owns a, a auto repair shop. Um and you know, his customers would want to sell their cars, but they weren't savvy with the internet. And so I would go take pictures of the cars, get them cleaned up, fixed up, uh, and I would invest my own capital into that. And then I put it on Craigslist and sell it for, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollar profit beyond what they wanted to sell it for. And so um, yeah, I was doing just a bunch of different hustles and, you know, stacking as much money as possible. That money was initially intended for me to go to college. Um, and, uh, and I realized that, you know, that wasn't necessarily the path that I wanted to take, um, early on. Uh, I knew I wanted to go to college, but I didn't want to use that money for college. Like I wanted to use that money to make more money. And so, um, you know, I worked at, um, uh, a Sprint and Nextel store, uh, and Metro PCS started to move into the market. I worked with this lady who ended up going to get a job at Metro PCS, um, basically approving franchise licenses and managing that market. Um, she, I reached out to, I was, I, the first thing I did actually, um, which, you know, I was, everyone turned me down. I, I basically, basically went to all of the neighboring stores in my area within like maybe a five to 10 mile radius. They knew who I was because like our store was like one of the biggest, you know, stores for, for the, the, the services that we sold. Uh, and they knew that I ran the store, um, by this time and I'm, I'm 16. You, and so you're I'm You're running a in. phone store at 16. You're the best salesperson. And yeah, then you easily. go to the other stores in the neighborhood. So what I, I went there to, to tell the owners, like, look, I want to, I have some money saved. I want to become an owner of the store. Um, and I can help you increase your sales and I can teach you strategies that we implemented to grow Sam's empire from one store to many stores. And, uh, a lot of them said no to me. Um, a lot of them didn't take me seriously, even if they knew my background and knew my track record and we ran well, into I each mean, other. I mean, in fairness, they were adults and you were 16 years old and you offered to buy their store. Well, it's, it's kind of a bold store. gambit. I mean, in fairness. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, well, I didn't. I didn't think about it in that that context. And uh, I guess did you have you a bank account that. at this point, or just like a, yeah, a briefcase yeah, so with I, cash? I went to I went to Southfield High School. I had cash and a bank account. I went to Southfield High School, uh, and we had a Michigan First Credit Union in our in our high school. And uh, and you actually got like ten dollars for starting an account. And so I you so know you started I wanted to get the ten dollars so I can <laughs> yeah so I could get uh get the account and I, I would just deposit money there. And then I had a shoebox, um, you know, with a, you know a few thousand bucks. Uh, so none of them took you up in the offer to buy them no. out. Yep. Yeah. We'll buy into it. I wanted to become partners. And so right, none right, of them right. took me, uh, took me up on that offer. Um, but you know, one day, you know, this, my c former colleague, she reached out to me and said, Hey, look, I had these two guys, their parents own some real estate and they're looking for, uh, a partner who is experienced, who knows about the market, who can sell, you know, phones, who knows all of the wholesalers, et cetera. And, uh, and they, 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 you know, want to meet you because I mentioned you to them. Now I haven't told them how old you are, but like, you know, I'll, I'll do so right before the meeting. Um, anyway, she sets the meeting up. They're pretty young too. They're like early twenties. Um, but they're like, look, if you can do what you say you can do and we, we trust her and have confidence in her, um, then we'll give you a shot. And so they let me buy into this, this partnership and we went from opening and they own the real estate they own the their, their parents did yeah their so parents their did. parents and family members did. Yeah. so you couldn't get the people who had the stores so you went to the people who they paid rent to 
And then I mean, yeah, I, that's you know, smart I sort way of to fell in my lap. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't even, you know, try to go that path. Like that wasn't, I didn't have visibility into that pathway. Um, I didn't know people who owned real estate at the time. But um, you know, luckily, I just built a really strong reputation. People knew me to work hard. People knew me to be um, an, an expert in this in this area and have just deep competency. Uh, and you know, people like me. And so, you know, I think that the universe sort of paid me back on that karma. And I luckily found some people who didn't, you know, discriminate or care about my age or you know what color my skin you know is uh and just wanted to give me an opportunity because they recognized that if you know if i won they won and uh and you know luckily that paid off we went from one store to to three stores we sold those stores end up you know leveraging that opportunity and through my mom again end up going to build this car rental with this guy named mark we ended up building a pretty big car rental business together went to school for a semester dropped out uh and and it was actually the story of groupon that really inspired me to get into tech and that 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 you know learnings and research around groupon uh, um, uh, led me to meeting this guy named John Trees at Ludlow, who gave me a ticket yeah. with the up to now StockX guys to go to the launch festival. And that Wait, blew my what? mind. I was t- oh, I start. I run the launch festival. Yeah, Wait yeah. A so it's it's, hold it's on, a hold full on, circle on. moment here. So you're in Detroit. You meet my friend Jonathan Trees. Jonathan Trees would sponsor the uh, when I started ticket. the launch festival. He would sponsor it. I give him like twenty tickets. Yeah, you got one of the golden tickets. So I sent them this super long email. I don't I don't know I don't know how many times we met in person prior to to this moment, but I sent them this long email. And I was just like, look, um, I pay for myself to get out there, uh, but you know, I need the ticket. And the tickets were decently expensive. Yeah. Um, and and I guess I could have probably just bought one of my own, but like why not? Well, I did, if, like, you know what I did was ticket? I made them free eventually because I realized yeah. there was more people like you out there who needed the opportunity. So I used to give all the sponsors like 20, 50 tickets. They just invited somebody who could do it. But then we wound up giving 15,000 tickets away for free in the peak yeah, year. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's crazy. No, look, I, uh, so I, so John, John, John gives me this ticket uh, and it changes my life. Uh, I, was that first the first time, time you ever, came to San Francisco? First time I ever left Detroit on my own. First time I taken a, a wow. flight. First time I booked a hotel. Wait, wait, this is like 10 years ago, I bet, or nine yeah, years ago? Yeah, this is like, I think 11 or 12, 2011 wow. or 12. Yeah, so this is super you early. Come like, out, I, you come out, I actually saw Uber for the first time, you know, when I was out there. That was when they were black cars still. Yeah, and you get to the launch festival and you see me on stage interviewing people. Yeah, and, you know, crazy inspirational moment for me. Um, uh, I met Thomas Court there, actually. So, yes, so anyway, I, legit. Look, I, come to the, I come to the launch festival. I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express by the airport because that was the only place that would let me book given my age and that's about eighty nine dollars um, hundred twenty nine dollars yeah i don't even remember how much it was but like i had to talk to the general manager to convince him to let me even stay and i didn't recognize how far it was right and so i would take cabs to like get everywhere and so um so yeah so i go to the launch festival the first thing i did was i watched you talk and interview a few people and then i you know walked the demo pit and i talked to every single person in that demo pit i guarantee you no one sent more follow-up emails after that to me and every time i would get a card i would kind of write after we stopped talking a couple points down uh like uh from like talking points down from our conversation and then sort of go to the next and uh and you know what i gotta start the launch festival back up in uh, in san yo, francisco you have to. I, I, had no, it, I put it in you know at san francisco was just breaking my chops too much like they they were shaking me down and making me pay for extra video people who were no-show jobs like the unions here they literally were protesting they're like you have they're like we, we need to have like four more video camera operators so i'm like yeah no i got my own team and they're like, yeah, you need four of our people. I'm like, no, no, I actually don't. I got, look, one, two, three, four. These are robotic cameras. These, I got this. They're like, yeah, no, you need four of ours or we're going to protest. Oh, wow. It's like, oh, my God. Yeah. Just no, nonstop. Look. And I just got exhausted from them, like literally shaking me down. And I was like, I just can't do it here anymore because I'm trying to do it for free. Um, yeah. And the demo pit was my other idea for making it free, which was the demo pit. I gave 100 people a free table each day, and it was three days. So 300 people. And yeah, I said, here's- a, here's a round table if you need high ethernet top. high top exactly cocktail table high top it's free if you need an ethernet connection uh you can use the wi-fi but that'll be down um mm-hmm. if you need a cable it's like 500 bucks to get a cable there that'll help pay for the ethernet uh but i suggest you just bring your lte or have a cam presentation you don't need to pay anything and if you need yep. power i suggest you bring a laptop and a be- extra battery pack but if you have, want power you got to pay like 100 bucks too to pay for this electrician so i just passed on those two costs to them and man so many people were like i, I can't believe this is free and i'm like but it doesn't really cost me anything i just the event cost a million bucks we break even and it changes lives so when we get back from here i want to know um who was the best speaker at that event and then how you flip the event because we heard how you flipped the cars into the job and the 
the Metro PCS into the stores, the Metro PCS into the uh, car rental, into meeting Jonathan Triest, into getting into the demo pit and meeting all those people and sending emails. But I need to know the next connection of how the how Play Versus started when we get back after this quick break. Now more than ever, we need people with the right skills to support our communities, especially the frontline workers who provide resources and care for those most in need. To help, LinkedIn is offering free job posts for healthcare and essential service organizations that need to quickly fill critical roles with the people who help us all. How amazing is that? If you're hiring for one of these organizations, LinkedIn's active community of over 679 million members unbelievable how big it's gotten can help you find the right people for the front line fast linkedin jobs screens candidates for the skills and experience you're looking for and it puts your job post in front of qualified people who meet your requirements so you can find the right person and you can fill critical roles quickly and properly with a talented person here's an example takeoffs.io is a launch portfolio company i invested in them and they build an ai enabled building materials marketplace it's a really cool product and last year their ceo chris was trying to hire an ai artificial intelligence engineer lead which is really difficult there's a lot of competition for these and it's a very unique skill set well he used linkedin jobs to find a perfect candidate after hearing about it here on This Week in Startups. And he got a candidate with a PhD in computer vision, and that employee has been with them for over a year, and he has rolled out several major projects. So here is your CTA, the old call to action. When it's time to hire and find the right person, LinkedIn is there to help. Plus, if you need to hire for healthcare or essential services, you can post your job for free. That's awesome, LinkedIn. Visit linkedin.com slash twist. Again, linkedin.com. You got that in your URL already. Just add slash twist, T-W-I-S-T, and you get that $50 for your first job post. Terms and conditions, of course, apply because they're giving you 50 bucks. Okay, let's get back. This is an amazing episode. All right, Delane Parnell is on the podcast, CEO and founder of Play Versus. I had no idea that I was in any way part of the story, but uh, I do think, you know, if you're out there and you're trying to um, make a name for yourself as an investor, what I always thought was this guy, um, uh, O'Reilly, Tim O'Reilly, and he had this idea about networks. He said, you just give more than you take. You just, if you give more than you take, you'll just get this incredible reputation and, and you will you just have to siphon off like 5% of whatever goodwill you're putting out in the world. Uh, and boy, has that worked for me in, in, in some of these investments I've made. So you came to that. That's great. Awesome. And then what happens next? Yeah. So, so yeah. So I'm like, you know, going through this demo pit you know, meeting everyone, following up with everyone. And then one day I run into Thomas Court. Uh, and I think he was a, he was speaking and then I sort of hunted him down. Angel after. investor, yeah. Great guy. Yeah, and this was before Angel, this was like him and his wife, I believe, were starting Angel Pad, but they hadn't run a cohort. Um, and I be, he was like, look, I gotta, he's like, you can walk and talk with me, go to the, uh, I would have to go through the demo pit. And he had this like notepad. And I was like, look, I've already seen every company. So let me take you to something that were really interesting. And so we basically do that. Oh, so and, smart. And right after, by the way, he was like, man, I should tell Jason that he should do this for everyone. Like like every speaker and investor should have a person who- Like a VIP you know, concierge, like an analyst. Yeah, exactly. You were an analyst. And so, yeah, exactly. And so Thomas says to me, hey, you should come work at, like you should work at this thing. Like you should move here and you know work at this thing that I'm doing. And it was AngelPad. And he's like, I can't pay you. Like he was very upfront. But, and, you know, because of that, I was like, ah, you know, I'm, I'm this kid from Detroit. I'm, you know, money is a, you know, super important resource for me as it is for everyone, but certainly given, you know, how, you know, we were in poverty, you know, and so like I needed to make money to be able to take care of myself, to help my family out. And so I didn't, I didn't factor in how big of an opportunity that was at the time because Oops. one, just lack of knowledge um, in the space and understanding. Um, but then two, you know, just given that, you know, I equated uh, opportunity to money, like whatever allowed me to make money. Uh, versus, you know, gain experience. So either way, like, you know, nothing ever happened there, but we sort of, you know, followed up and sort of stayed in touch. And and there was another thing that happened. I ended up meeting uh, David Cohen from Techstars through, because of Minbox. So Alex uh, Mimran, who won Best Design um, uh, from Minbox, him and I- We were investors in Minbox, yeah. Okay, yeah, and so- um, so him and I basically end up linking up somehow and we end up basically like just being together a lot during the, um, during the event and we end up catching an Uber together to like, I think it was like a W hotel or something like that. And every, like everyone was ringing his phone when after they won and like on our way to like find whatever this thing called Uber was. Um, and, 
Uh, and yeah, and I was just like blown away. And, you know, him and I were just kind of talking about some of the decisions that he wanted to make around. Cause I think the prize was to like a spot in tech stars or something like that. And so like what he wanted to do. And, um, and yeah, it was just like, man, it was just such a eye opening experience for me. You know, I left there and went back to Detroit and a couple of things happened for me. One, from seeing you do those interviews, I recognized that that's like a format, right? A fireside chat. So I start hosting my own events in Detroit and this is before Dan had bought a building, before any really big venture funds. And, and these, these, these events become really popular. Um, you talk about Dan Gilbert? Yeah, this is, yeah, before Dan Gilbert had owns the, Cle the building. Cleveland Cavaliers. I mean, he owns the city of Detroit and the Cleveland Cavaliers and Quicken Loans, which is, you know, one of the biggest yeah. private companies in the world. And so, yeah, before before he'd done any of his investments in the city, like, you know, I was basically doing a lot of grassroots stuff with a handful of people in an entrepreneurship community around these events. And I would call them uh, 50 founders. Uh, that was the initial name. And the concept was I was going to convince my favorite 50 founders to come to Detroit, do a fireside chat. Um, and That's a brilliant I, idea. I like the yeah, branding. You yeah. got you got a thing for the branding. 50 yeah, founders, yeah. pretty good. <laughs> and so initially I ended up like changing it. I mean, eventually I ended up changing the name to... Uh, to um, uh, got starter talks. Yeah, because uh, Jason Freed from uh, uh, in Chicago signals. from you know Basecamp. He thirty seven uh, signals. Yeah, yeah, thirty seven signals. He he basically talked about like the concept of a starter, basically uh, instead of like replacing the word entrepreneur. And I was like, oh, I like that. I like that concept. Like, I'm going to change the name to Starter Talks, and uh, and we end up bringing guys like Alexis Ohanian and Charles Allen from Kickstarter and um, sure. tons of other folks to Detroit. Um, and it was it became like this thing, you know. And Dan eventually. You know, his team ended up supporting it pretty heavily. Um, and yeah, it was just this big thing. And I sort of leveraged that opportunity end up because I had all these relationships with entrepreneurs and I wanted to like events. Um, you know, you, you mentioned this, you know, about like even the city of San Francisco. Like we know that like events are a, a very difficult business to monetize. And I had this I had great empathy for entrepreneurs and I wanted to find a way to support them. But I also needed to be able to monetize the time I was spending there. And, um, you know, I ended up basically deciding to go try to find a job at a venture fund. It had a few offers um, because like that was sort of the best way. Like I had these relationships. I had good deal flow. Um, you know, people in Detroit lack relationships on the coast between San Francisco, L.A. and New York. And I had decent, decent Rolodex of people who like me from those those places because of my relationships um, through the events. And so Tom Lasorda, who was the CEO of Chrysler, ended up doing one of my events and ended up offering me a job at this venture fund that him and Roger Pinsky and Dieter Zetsch from Mercedes-Benz was starting. Uh, and, you know, I went and, and did that. Um, left there, went to uh, go work at this uh, startup that Dan had put thirty million into called Rocket Fiber on the, on the early team, and then it was there where I got really deep into esports. And in uh, fast forward, you know, sort of meet Peter Pham uh, just by happenstance in Austin, Texas at South by. Um, so you go to uh, South and, by, uh, and you literally run into my man Peter Pham. Yeah, yeah, Peter. Uh, where well, I didn't necessarily run into him. We were at this house party called the Culture House, and I was oh, walking I by to find my boy Marcus Carey, who's a phenomenal entrepreneur that Dan actually just recently backed uh, in Detroit and from Detroit. And uh, and yeah, and 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 Susie from um, uh, I guess what I, their fund is called Cross Culture, but I think they partner with Macro, so it might be a different name. But she works with Troy Carter. She she grabs me and say, "Hey, so do you know do you know Peter?" And um, you know, Peter is dancing. If you anyone yeah, knows no, no, Peter's no. family, like, they know Peter's his Peter's out, thing. he's dancing, yes. Yo, Probably Peter's with his shirt off. Show is the only person shirt on or in shirt his entire off. house party dancing. And he had a speaker, like there's a DJ, and he was right next to the DJ, but he had a speaker on his belt, which was Wait, super weird. Shirt on, shirt and off. Peter Fam shirt, shirt was on. Oh, shirt, shirt was on. on. Shirt on. Yeah, okay, so it was early. I've, it was I've seen him with the, yeah, It was super early. It was, it was like, like seven. Two o'clock. Yeah. It was uh it was super early After in the party. Shirts off. Shirts off seven thirty. By the way, Peter's ripped. You know, people no, are No, I know. Man. That's why his shirt's yeah. off. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> so, yeah. So, anyway, I mean, And he Peter, can dance. He can dance, too. I mean, it, sometimes a little provocative, but, like, he can dance, sure. Like, no, trust me, because my wife likes to dance, and then, like, every time we go, like, we've been on vacation a couple times, we've gone out a couple times, and it's just, like, I need a break. I'm not, like, some big dancer, you know? I'll just get on the dance floor. I'll bounce a little bit to the beat or whatever, but... And I just want to sit and chill and pop a bottle or something. And then, like, he's grabbing my wife and spinning her around on the dance floor. <laughs> and I'm like, Peter, okay, enough. Put your shirt back on and put my wife Yo, back on. I've taken Peter to some rap parties, like rappers' parties. Uh, like, recently, we went to Meek Mill's party and uh, it got so crazy. They called Peter onto the stage and Peter was dancing with my homie PJ Kev, who's, you know, really big in hip hop and culture, you know, part of the Dream Chaser family. And so uh, it, was, it was insane. And celebrities were like tweeting about Peter the next day you know, following them online. <laughs> it was pretty insane. It's a bit yeah, much. No, you know what thing is, Peter's got a little bit of the OCD. 
And so, True. like, his brisket game is also getting very tight. And, you know, I, I'm smoking my brisket. I'm pretty famous for my brisket out here in, in the valley. And then I wake up and I just see this guy with the butcher paper and he's got bark on that brisket that's just like, <laughs> it literally is, I don't want to even say it, but he's got better bark on his brisket than I do. And I'm just like, I got up my bark game here. Listen, Peter has, you know, he uses a lot of gadgets. So so take it with a grain no, of salt. No, I know. It's just ridiculous. It's just Peter Pham is just so focused. And yeah. yeah. So Peter, I mean, I'm so a better Peter's... investor, but he's definitely got a better body, <laughs> better dancing and better bark. I mean, Peter, I'm better uh... at investing than him, but that's the only thing. Like in terms of our careers, I'm better at our careers, but the, okay. you know, the extracurricular stuff, he's definitely better at. Hey, well, look, both of you guys have amazing careers. <laughs> I'm just One effing, to be I'm effing with you, Peter. I know, I know. I Yo, haven't so, had Peter on the pod in a while. I got Peter on the pod. So wait, you meet him and you yeah, pitch so, him on what? I don't pitch him at all. And oh. so, you know, we're, we're just talking about esports because Susie's like, hey, you know, you should talk to Delaney. He's thinking about esports. And yeah, Peter and I, uh, be, I'm, I'm, we're talking. He's like, how do you think about the space, et cetera? And so um, he's like, yo, give me, we're talking for like 30 minutes and just high level esports. And he's like, yo, give me your info. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to call you. And so I give him my phone number. I don't really think anything of it. And the next day he calls me. He's like, hey, I've been thinking about what you've been thinking about, but you should think about that um, from a go to market around high school, um, given some of the challenges that I laid out. And so, you know, he asked me to come to LA, spend a bunch of time with his partners, Mike, Tom, Greg. Um, and the rest of their team. And over a few month period of time, I do so. And then, you know, I, I was dragging my feet, truthfully. And Peter reaches out to me and was like, look, you could be a millionaire in Detroit or a billionaire in LA, but like, don't waste my time. And literally got off the phone with him, uh, called my brother, packed everything that I own in my place, gave it away, um, you know, took my car to the dealership, found the place uh, in Playa Vista and moved to LA. Like I was in LA by that weekend, like Saturday. Did you have um, the idea totally hashed out or you just had this no. idea that esports was a thing and then how much of the idea was like peter's or yours or you just riffed on it had the idea actually manifest itself yeah so like my, my vision and it sort of still remains the same is look we want to build the um, competition infrastructure around amateur esports we want to be the single place where every single person who wants to play esports whether it's in a head-to-head -head match a tournament or a season on behalf of your school or otherwise you you like we want to be that place where you do so and we want to monetize that through subscription we essentially want to build a hundred million plus user subscription business um uh, around you do e realize that only five people have done that in the history of humanity sure so verizon expect netflix, netflix spotify spotify amazon Amazon, correct, Prime. Yo, uh, it's all good. Wait, so there's somebody we'll else. AT&T yeah. get there? Com no, Comcast never got there. AT&T never got there. Disney's going to get there. Disney will be... Yeah, yeah. and play Versus. And, and play so, Versus. Yeah, or, so, you know, look, look. the reality is like no one, no one's, uh, no one's done that. Gaming is like one of the biggest entertainment, um, you know, consumptions and behaviors where no one's aggregated um all of that into a there's no platform. amazon like, prime or netflix for sure i mean yeah but like the in, like you could say that like maybe twitch or discord like these different platforms they're not subscriptions those people, are but all, they're not subscription they got a different model and beyond that they're only they're aspects of gaming and so they're sort of this emerging platform attached to a specific aspect of gaming so broadcast communication even if you think about steam from valve that's distribution the essence of why people game is competition no one's built a competition mm. platform that has aggregated this behavior and the reason is because you need to work with game publishers and publishers similar to like record labels are are uh you know move hollywood studios like they're very wall guarded they if they don't build for third-party connection they don't care about ecosystem if they could be the only company that does that or do what they do, like they they would, you know, they wouldn't work with anyone. You uh, you you read the Mike Ovitz book? It's incredible. He's, he's supposed to come on the pod. I've, I'm like three or four emails into it with him, but now that it's virtual, there's no reason for him not to come on the pod. Yo, uh, I haven't read the book, but I know Ovitz. Uh, he's he's one of my two CEO coaches, him and Dick Costello. Um, and I mean, he's just a legend, man. You know, I was actually All right, so I can't I get him. Can you can you do me a favor? I I'll mean, I helped you out you. with the launch festival. Can you put in a good word with me with Mr. Yeah, Ovitz? I'll, to I'll text him right after this, and I'll say, "Look, man, you have to do this week in startups." I just did it's a big deal. Thank you. I, I appreciate it, Delaney. Hundred percent. Since my Ovitz producers is, uh, can't get it done, I'll every get every you time Delaney. I've ever went out to eat with Ovitz, we've never looked at a menu and we've never paid. Um, we just go. Oh, did you go down. to his sushi place? I've been there too. Yeah, that's pretty tight. Um, yeah, that's actually fire. Yeah, corner, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, they don't even let you park if he's coming. You know, I'm, I'm like, yo, I need to valet too. Uh, so uh, he's a cool no, cat. He's a cool, he's all a my friends dude. are very good friends with him. I met him like two or three times, uh, and uh, the book is incredible. I can't believe you haven't read the book yet. No, I'll read it. Um, I listen was actually, to it. I listen to it. It's a great listen. 
It goes okay, cool. Yeah, I'll do that. I, I want to talk to him about the Travis Kalanick story. I was uh, I was watching an interview from like 2011 or 12. Yeah, that's a crazy story. And yeah, Kalanick was talking about how, you know, Ovis had basically sued Listen, him. Listen, there were a couple things that, <laughs> you know, in the Ovitz history of like, you know, dead fish on a hood of a car for a journalist kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Wow. That yeah, was I'm settled. Not surprised. There was a guy, Anthony Pelicano or something. Anyway, it, it got rough and tumble. There were some people doing some crazy stuff in the 90s. But I Ovis think Mr. Ovitz had nothing to do with that. He's like that, the godfather. I think, listen, Mr. Ovitz has always acted in the highest moral and ethical uh, way. 100%. That's my Look, position, 100. Mike, if you need any character witnesses, you have both me and Jason. Absolutely, absolutely. Listen, it's not like I haven't dug a ditch in my day. Listen, I've had to do some <laughs> things in Brooklyn when I grew up. Um, all right, so how do you interface with the publishers because my understanding was they see the community aspects as, as a big part of their game i know especially with Fortnite um and league of legends i think they run their own stuff don't they or not explain to me how this all works can can yeah. you run i mean is there any reason you can't run competitions through your platform if you're just people are subscribing to you as a way to do matchmaking sure can yeah. they stop so you from using it so that's a, that's a, there's a lot to unpack there. I'll just briefly say too. So, you know, didn't have the idea when I first moved to LA, spent six months really working against it. Matt Mazio from KOTU prior lowercase gave Peter Pham the idea around going to market in high school. Peter never disclosed that, but Mazio ended up investing in. So that's how I found out, you know, we start the company in January to your point around publishers. Like, you know, I do that, you know, six months in 2017 from like June or July through December, you know, I spent a lot of time you know, I'm not only thinking about like the broader vision, but specifically how we're going to go to market around high school, how we're going to add value back to this community and give them incentive to play, how we're going to do so in a legitimate way and uh, and find kind of this effective distribution channel. We end up discovering that through, you know, our relationship with the NFHS, just given that's how all sports, you know, essentially operate or, you know, scale within our country through the NFHS and state associations. Um, and you know, uh, initially, like I was hoping like sign publishers first and then leverage the publishers to get the NFHS. But what I found is that like, you're right, like IP holders don't like if you don't have any leverage or you don't have any value for them, you know, them working with you to build something is like doesn't help them create new content and sell that content, you know, and create more jobs and revenue, et cetera, for their business. And so they're unlikely to work with you. However, at this time, like esports is this like growing thing. Publishers are starting to develop their competency. Um, they a lot of them, as you mentioned, like they run their own events. Those events are at the pro level. So all of the publishers have sort of decided that like pro is where their competency will fall and they'll build their infrastructure internally around pro events. A lot of those events are live, so they're not online play. Everything can amateur which is you know the you know 2.4 billion gamers in a row besides a thousand pro players um like that's sort of up for grabs but um the only way that you can actually build a big company there is to have relationship with the publisher because you need to integrate with them both operationally and technically and you obviously need the rights commercialization rights to be able to monetize on their game and to be able to operate on their game and many people in esports actually don't do that like they they just try to they act as if this is you know basketball and you can go to a dick sporting goods and start your own league and many investors have like lost money because they just invest in these companies without talking to um you know the publishers and asking about the status of their relationship or lack of relationship um and you know journalists are no better right like they write about these companies without taking into account that they might be doing things that they they can't actually do because they don't have the proper rights. And so, you know, I end up basically, you know, doing that deal with the NFHS to secure distribution into a unique all own audience, right, of high school kids in our country um, and uh, leveraging that to go out and get the publishers. Because if you're a publisher and you want to have a professional league, you're spending millions or hundreds of millions of dollars into the development of that, then at some point you're going to need, need a sustained ecosystem around talent. So whether it be yeah, coaches or Why would they rebuild it players. if you have it? They could just let you... Yeah, well, it's, it's just a significant risk for them, right? Because they they would have to build that infrastructure to support every high school for every IP. And many publishers have, you know, a bunch of different games and a lot of their games are esports and they're separate teams. Like they're, maybe they have some shared resources, but they're standalone teams. And so if they wanted to be like Activision Blizzard, where Bobby Kotick wanted to build high school, then he would need to build it for Hearthstone, for Starcraft, for, you know, Overwatch, for... Shout out um, Starcraft too. Yeah, That's what like I whatever play. game, right? Whatever esports. So that could... That Coach could end up being life. five or six or seven different teams doing the exact same thing. How, it's how much uh, risk, not really scalable. How, how far behind the times am I as a uh, StarCraft II is the only game I play? 
Yeah, you're you're you're, square, you're right? super far behind. Yeah, super far, like, uh, super square. Yeah, we got you're not a square. I mean, people still play StarCraft too, uh, and Star like people love StarCraft in general as a as a as a series. Um, but like, yo, you got to catch up, man. There's tons of games out here. I um, tried this um, League of Legends. It's a difficult game. I suck at League of Legends. I'm There's the worst two, League of Legends player two, known to men. Explain to me, because they kind of broke my brain. There are so many characters and so ma so many abilities, and it keeps changing. Like, in order to just have a base level of knowledge of League of Legends, to to get a base level of knowledge, it's got to be like 500 hours. Yeah, uh, easy. I mean, I don't easy. know the exact amount of hours, but I could totally see 500 hours. Um, but the, the, look, the kids have time to do that. Like, people, people I have who kids, enjoy so I don't have, have time, time to do that. Do that. Yeah, you know, there's there. I gotta there get are my daughter to start playing League of Legends with me because there's no the only way I'm ever gonna get good at this is if I can because I have to spend time with her. Maybe I get her to do it with me. I she's been watching. Me you know who does that by the way? Who? Mike Jones uh, from uh, Science. H ah. Him, his daughter, and his son. They have like he's the, uh, basically a dad of uh, two League of Legends uh, clubs between his his son and his daughter, and he didn't you know organizes competitions for them. And uh, and uh, and he obviously coaches like their soccer teams and stuff like that. But like that's one of his favorite activities to do with his kids. It's like you know set up league that's matches actually between one of the cool friends. aspects of this is that there does gen gender doesn't even play into this. Are there girl leagues versus boy leagues, or is it just all one league? Yeah, no. So I mean, the the beauty of of it's at least what we do uh, is that it's co-ed. So boys and girls on the same team also compete against each other. And because That's amazing. They're like an actual physical in school environment um, is actually less toxic too, right? Girls who play online, they often um, get harassed. You know, yeah. Get harassed, yeah. Um, and you know, when when they're playing in an environment with people that they know and trust, uh, and that's a safe environment because there's adult supervision, is actually a really safe environment yeah. for them to do something they love. Actually, and, and, that's and we've the actually for realized that. Because, you know, many of our championship teams at the state level have women players or women coaches, and they love it. They absolutely love uh, uh, the fact that they can do something that they enjoy and, you know, build genuine friendships. Well, one with, of the things with, I would never do is let my kids play on those services because I know the adults on those services, there's predators on those services, there's people are saying crazy stuff. I mean, you've heard the, you know, clip transcripts from like Xbox streams where people are just yeah. saying every bad word you could imagine and just really brutal. Like, and then there's 12 year olds and 14 year olds on those services. But what's great about this is if it's in a school setting, there's a code of conduct and there's a ramification. If you were to say certain words on the stream, you would get kicked off the team. Yeah. And we, we also limit the communication player to player in general. Ah. Um, so, you know, players like because school A plays school B, they don't travel to each other. So like players are generally not communicating against the other teams. There's no like chat functionality built into our product for players, but coaches can communicate. Um, and, and you'd be surprised. There are, there are some instances where one coach is too passionate um, and are more passionate than another, uh, not necessarily too passionate. And they might, you know, jump out the window and say some things that are against, you know, our the coaches context, might lose issues. Yeah, I mean, would look, they do what the Patriots do and like just be all out cheaters? Have you found people like the New England Patriots who just cheat? No, our our no, our no have Patriot cheaters and and uh, an incredibly high competitive integrity. Like we all take it very seriously at the company and obviously our community as well. And so yeah, we haven't you know knock on wood, we haven't uh, uh, you know found anyone cheating um, within this environment. So nobody like the are, New England are, Patriots cheating. These are co these are coaches that are faculty members at a school who recognize that there are consequences to, to those sort of actions included in their job. Yeah. So, yeah, so they don't cheat like the Patriots is what you're saying. Well, I don't know if the Patriots cheated. In fact, the no, Patriots have been really No, it's just my way really of trolling New England. It's yeah, listen, yo, the Patriots and Robert Kraft have given us their facility for our Massachusetts State Championship. Okay, I, okay so I can't like four slay, seasons. I, okay, I understand. Yo, so listen, gotta... we're big fans of the Patriots. Absolutely big fans of the Patriots. Uh, I, uh, I take it all back. Thank you for all your support. I'm just yeah. saying that even with, all the, <laughs> even with all the alleged cheating by Bill Belichick, they still didn't beat the Giants, though, which is interesting. You know, Nick, they tried to beat the Giants, but they lost in the Super Bowl to the Giants, right? If I, mean, I remember Giants correctly, this, that one lucky catch from Plaxico Burris or whatever his name is. It's 2012, um, you know, and they the cheaters lost. They as much cheating as they uh, allegedly do, they still couldn't beat my Giants. Hmm, that's interesting. New England fans, come at me at Jason Twitter at Jason uh, on uh, <laughs> Tumblr at Jason on. Talk about Saquon's quads, quads. <laughs> It's insane. It's the size um, of that table. <laughs> So the road, you've raised $97 million for this. 
And I just want to take a moment because you talked about like, hey, some people maybe don't invest in people who are my color and, you know, from where I'm from. When you look back at this incredible journey and you're assessing uh, diversity in tech and the ability of somebody who's a nobody, who's flipping cars and uh, working at Metro PCS uh, to break into this industry, you did it. What do people who assume you cannot break into this industry, and you got Mike Ovitz as a coach. Um, Don't forget my boy Dick podcast. Costello. What's that? And Dick Costello, respect. Yeah, Dick, uh, Dick's amazing. Dick's a great guy. He's a great guy. Um, we were both, uh, he just invested in a company, a Density, that I'm, was one of the launch festival companies. I don't oh, remember yeah. Density, the I, I, people I, counter. I actually hung out with Andrew, the uh, the CEO, uh, at dinner not long ago. Uh, loved that company. Um, company. Ludlow was an investor in that company. That's how I found out about that it. I introduced him to Jonathan. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So here Makes you sense. are. You broke into it, just like I broke into it. Kid from Brooklyn, kid from Detroit. The tech industry seemed to me, as somebody who broke into it, it wasn't in, there was an, info I, I had a hard time figuring out all this information because I had to get it from magazines, then it all went online. What I used to do to try to get into events is I couldn't get into the events either and the events were $4,000 back then. So yeah. what I would do is I would lobby crash. So oh, you got in hustle. through Jonathan, but I would just hang out in the lobby and then eventually Esther Dyson or Kara Swisher or Tim O'Reilly would literally hand me a badge and be like, Jason, just go in. Like they would literally just, you know, give me the miracle. But what what do you think about race and tech? And, you know, people sort of look at tech and say, hey, this is like a bunch of Stanford white guys, whatever. Um, and an African-American is going to have uh, the deck stacked against them. What's true? What's not true? How has it changed? What can you tell other people who maybe feel like it's hard to get into this business and break into it as somebody who not only broke into it, but took over? Yeah, sure. Look, this is a. Uh this is a, a big topic of discussion and there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but yeah, look, it's, it's the, 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 the deck is totally stacked against, you know, people of color. Um, and just because I've had success, um, doesn't mean that, you know, um, the, the industry, um, you know, has, has found a new appreciation for, um, people of color and, you know, black entrepreneurs specifically. Um, look, you know, I'm an outlier and, uh, you know, of whatever 40, 50, 60, 70 years of venture capital to, you know, be a solo founder, to be this young, to go out and raise this much capital in such a short period of time from top investors. But there's tons of other founders who look just like me, who deserve those opportunities, who may be even further along than, than we are today or, or were when we raised that capital. Uh, and they don't get that opportunity. I don't know if I got that opportunity if it wasn't for a guy like Peter Pham, you know, truthfully supported me and backing me and leveraging his, you know, uh, uh, recognition and credibility in the space to give me, give me an edge. Um, and so, yeah, look, you know, uh, VCs need to start hiring people, um, of color on their teams and in meaningful positions beyond, um, the assistant or the person who does, you know, diversity and inclusion events, um, or, you know, just having one person in a room just to say they do. Um, uh, so what you're uh, saying there you know, is a lot of this VC hiring is they're hiring, hiring marginalized people and marginalizing them inside the organization. Yeah, look, they're just trying to, they're just inventorying. They're like, oh, we need Inventory. a diversity person. Yeah, we need let's, a number let's, here. Let's, yeah, let's, let's put go the get number. That yeah. yeah, let's put, and uh, then we, we need an assistant. you know what the let's... move is too? Then they alpha, I always, t I can always tell when they're doing this too, because they alphabetize the uh, page for the team. Because sure, you used yeah. to put the team, like the people, the founders up top, then the next year, then the next year, then the support team, which makes yeah. sense. Like if you were coming to a website, you would want to know who's in charge Executive here. Executives first, yeah. They're just like, you know what? Let's put it alphabetical so that we can have the diversity. Um, and that's so lame. I mean, listen, it's something, but I agree with you. It's kind of lame. Like you have to yeah, have check writing ability at some point. I mean, yeah, check writing abilities. Um, we need, uh, uh, you know, you need to, you, you need to have uh, locations and places where people of color are are present, like or at least travel there, right? Atlanta, Detroit, Chicago. Um, uh, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's even communities here in LA, Inglewood, Slaw, you know, um, uh, any, any, like Inglewood. You know, I uh, spent a Ingle lot of time in Inglewood uh, when I lived in LA. You know why? Why? Hollywood Park. I've never been there. Hollywood yeah. Park is, uh, a casino and racetrack. And I used to go down there and play poker. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. I don't, I would I don't play, know poker play poker from 10 PM. I'll finish up at five or 6 AM, go home, take a shower, eat breakfast, and then go to work. 
<laughs> that's oh, how wow. degenerate I was with my friend's yeah, guy dating. Just, we would go play overnight. That sounds like a whole Molly's game type vibe. I was invited to Molly's game over and over again. I didn't go because oh, I that's was insane. A, they'd be like, Molly would text me, hey, uh, Leo's here and uh, Toby's here and they really want to oh, see you. I was like, yeah. they want to see me lose 50 grand. They don't want to see me. Yeah, These guys yeah, are sharks. Insane. Like Toby McGuire is a great poker player. I play with Toby many times and he is a great poker player who likes to inflict pain on people. Yeah. No, so that's crazy. Would, if you were giving advice to a founder who is underrepresented and you said, hey, listen, here's the straight dope. Just let me just give you five bullet points of how I did it. Or you were writing your book and you had to just write a summary of it for the book publisher. Here's the five things. Do this, 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 and this. This is the best way to get in. I mean, I could, I have my own thoughts just hearing your story, but I want to hear what you think you did right and what you would tell, you know, the next uh, person coming up who couldn't get in. Yeah, yeah. I, look, I've, I haven't thought about this, so I'll give you things that um, come sort of top to mind. But uh, but even then, too, I just want to make note that you know, even if they do all five of these things and more. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's likely that, you know, they don't, they still don't get the opportunity, certainly not this grand, um, you know, just because look, the, you know, the, the way that this industry is set up, it's designed and I mean, this country even, you know, is designed to, you know, suppress black people or people of color to not give us opportunity. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think there's a number of things that we can do to change that. Obviously we should put pressure on our VCs to do that. I didn't even take a check by the way, from uh, a founder, I mean, an investor who hadn't already supported another black person. Um, that was a, a, a very, you know, consistent question that I asked every fund. You know, I remember walking into Sequoia and, um, and there was interest from Sequoia and, you know, they have that wall with all of the, the yeah. logos up there of like their successful companies. And I asked the, the person I'm sitting across, I'm like, Hey, how many of those founders are black? And they were like, none that I believe, you know, you could be the first. And I was like, look, you know, I don't want to be the first. Like, uh, I want to, I want to go to, uh, and be part in partnership with uh, a group of people who, who already support people like me, uh, who understand me. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I'm luckily I found that at NEA, they're amazing. Uh, another big thing for me was that, you know, if we're going to have a board, the independent seat on the board had to be a woman. Um, and, you know, NEA also believed in that and they doubled down on that um, through the term sheet. And so, yeah, I think, um, you know, all of those things were, you know, diversity in general and inclusion. In, in general are super important to me. And I think in tech specifically on the VC side, like there's a number of things that we can do on the company side. Look, I think one of the, certainly like, you know, we want more people of color engineers in these sort of higher or highest paid positions at the company. We want more uh, people of color executives, but we also need people of color in HR positions. Um, that's actually something that a lot of people don't talk about. Like, you know, Why is HR, that important? I mean, I have, yeah, I can I mean, read into it, yeah, but you explain Sure, why. yeah. Look, I mean, HR is how you get your foot in the door. HR is, you know, the, the people who understand who you are and make the decisions about if you stay or not, if some sort of dispute comes up. Um, or, you know, maybe if you imagine being, I had a friend who worked in private equity and he was the only black person on an all white male team mostly. Um, and, you know, like they didn't, they just didn't understand them. They were like very basic things like, you know, the, the way if his hair would like get too long, they would make comments about it. Um, and, and, you know, oftentimes they would even report these things to HR as if he made them uncomfortable. Um, and if you have people of color in HR positions, like they're able to course correct that because they're able to educate people um, who lack education around interactions or knowledge of people of color, even something as simple as your hair. Um, um, and uh, and so yeah, we need to we need to have more people of color in HR um, to open up the the doors to like get us in to train us to give us grace when we make mistakes um, to give us um, to invest in us from like a professional skill set development um, and uh, and yeah and like that's a that's a super important you know role that that a lot of people don't talk about um, and you know, you know what the thing we, that was at play versus by the way the last thing I'll, I'll add here before I I'll let you speak sorry Jason um, no no go. is that you know at play versus we. Uh, you know, we were looking for a head of a uh, talent um, and, you know, my team had interviewed a bunch of people um, and we, we were even going to put an offer out on someone. But I believe in it so much. I was like, look, I'm going to go find the best person of color to represent, you know, our company in this position. And we luckily found this guy named Charles who was at Airbnb and then Facebook before and sort of brought him on as a head of talent. And, and I know a lot of, you know, founders in the, in the black community saw that and it was like, wow, a black CEO, a black head of talent at, you know, a hot startup, um, you know, and like, you know, like that, like we should make this a trend. Like we should, we should. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty to, clever. To I gotta be honest. Beautiful. It's super clever. How has it been for you since you have that intentionality to find the talent you need because uh, African-Americans might be underrepresented in certain job roles. And 
do you, do you have to work harder to to draw people or do people look at it and say, oh, black CEO, black HR director, I can feel comfortable coming to this company and you get this advantage, uh, a, a diversity advantage because you're showing people, just like you said, hey, maybe this venture firm hasn't done a lot of investment in people who look like me. Um, maybe I need to go uh, find another venture firm. People are going to do the opposite. They're going to come to your firm, right? Sure. Yeah. Look, there's there's certainly people who are interested in working um, at at Play Versus because you know I'm a I'm a young black CEO and I've done stuff that you know one other um, no 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 other person has done that that you know represents our community and that's certainly uh, amazing and we obviously love that sort of influx of volume that we get because of that. Um, but you know I really would say that we have probably one of the most diverse companies ever. Even at this stage, you walk into Play Versus and you see all sorts of shades. You see a good balance of men and women. Um, um, you see, you know, people who worked in education, people who worked only in tech, you know, people who founded companies before. Um, so just across the board, like it's a very diverse group of people, uh, even at the executive level. And and the only reason that 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 exists and our company looks like that relative to even in, in you know other portfolios for some of our investors, you know, all of these companies are all white men or all white men and women, um, is because we are intentional. And sure, it takes it takes more time to make hires. It requires tons of hard work and uh, uh, and effort. It requires you to go to places to find talent that you normally wouldn't go to. It may even require you, require you to have a decent relocation budget to to move people to to whatever market you're in. But like, it's important um, because our our company is super beautiful. You know, like it, and it has all of these incredible people. Like we have qualities within our innovation stack that other people don't. Like we know things that other people don't, and we're able to make better decisions um, uh, because we're able to relate to more people uh, and more of uh, more circumstances and backgrounds. And so, um, yo, it's uh, it's it's certainly hard work, but recruiting is hard work in general. And so, yeah. you should be intentional about that. And uh, and one way to solve for that, by the way, as a as a founder or an executive at a company, is to say, look, you know, my HR and my recruiting team um, should be very diverse, and and those people will be really intentional about you know going and hiring people that look like them. And then you won't see, you know, um, uh, companies that have, you know, one to 3%, you know, African Americans or, or, or other people of color, you know, within these 10, 20, 50,000, you know, person Yeah, I think company. it's, you got to get it right in the first 10, 20 hires. And if you don't, it just steers in whatever direction you started because sure. a job comes up and people tell their friends about it and their circles might not be diverse. And so I've seen this with companies founded by Indian founders or, you know, Asian founders or African American founders or white founders or Stanford founders. It just you you just start getting this click where it's like, oh yeah, we were we went to Stanford together. All of a sudden you got six Stanford people in one company, sure. like PayPal, right? And it's just like, yeah, we we were all in the same I know somebody from the computer science class, whatever, or we all worked at this company prior. We were all worked at, you know, Microsoft before this. And before you know it, the the whole company has bended in a certain direction and, and it's very hard to then reverse it, right? Because then the next person coming in is like, oh, this is a bunch of, you know, white guys from Stanford or Asian guys from Harvard or Indian guys from uh, who are Microsoft folks. I'm not part of the culture, right? Yeah, and I'm not saying, you know, too, don't hire people of color. Um, I mean, or hire people of color just because, right? Just to oh. have inventory of those people. Like you go out and you get the most qualified and quality person. Yeah. Um, but be intentional about making sure that you're interviewing. A, a, you know, at least 50% people of color, 50% women for, for each job. And we try to do that internally. Uh, and then we make the best hire, um, best cultural hire, best skill hire. Um, you know, and that's we the way always we try to optimize also for leadership. The big uh, unlock for us was we have something called Founder University, which we realized like the launch festival got so big that we couldn't actually enjoy it or get to meet anybody because we're so busy, you know, uh, shuffling in the beginning, two or 3,000 people and then eventually 15,000 people from stage to stage and lots of moving parts and unions shaking us down in San Francisco, the corrupt unions of San Francisco shaking us down. It was brutal. And then we started Founder University, which was 60 founders pre-selected who were all right before we would invest. Like maybe they're finishing their product. They maybe have one or two customers, but you know they're, they're right before our, our entry point as an investor. And we did one for women, uh, and then we started doing one for underrepresented founders, and we let them self-select. So, you know, we would get some like, well, I'm gay, or I'm trans, or I'm, you know, could be a white woman, and a white woman might consider herself underrepresented. And that might be true. I mean, some people will debate it, and I, I, we didn't want to be in the debate of if you consider yourself underrepresented, so we let yourself select that. Um, and that's how we wound up having, like, literally two or three times 
the number of qualified founders who were in our investment thesis, right? And it was yeah. a very interesting lesson for me because I gave away all those tickets and you came, but yeah. still Thank in the you, audience, the way, for that. even with the free tickets, we didn't there see weren't crazy many people of color. Yeah. No, listen, I was I was one of very few black people at that conference. Um yeah. and and the you know the ones that were there, we all really linked up um yeah. and, and sort of you know stayed close to each other. Um but uh but look, you know in general, look, I appreciate, you know, the effort that you put in even that early when no one was having this conversation and that obviously led to, you know, me, you know, learning more about tech, being inspired by the in industry and being motivated to go That's do amazing. something in this space and like look, you know, if you know a few years later you know, I'm gonna. I've raised the the most money in the sh shortest amount of time uh, as a solo founder of any other black person, and without launch, like Crazy. that doesn't happen. And so, and I'm um, so happy so, yeah. that like before the show, you said you were gonna hook me up with 50 basis points, and I was gonna be an official <laughs> advisor to the company. Look at that, make good. I I, I got some shares yeah, I, in this. I don't I don't pay for dinner when people have more money than me, and yeah. I don't give wealthier people than me free things. Uh, well, but, yo, we can listen. Talk. You're only about eight at this pace. You're 18 months about being the person who's paying, who's buying me dinner. So you're about 18 months away from that. <laughs> anyway, ho hopefully, hopefully. I think I'm so, actually. I'm doing a little math right now. I, I, <laughs> I know how uh, Series C's work. Uh, it's about 20% of the company. Uh, yeah, I think you're doing okay. Uh, listen, this has been amazing. Hey, would you do me a favor? I don't know if you're up for this, but um, we started a Slack room. It's called thisweekinstartups.com slash Slack. 14,000 people in it. And I want to start doing AMAs with the guests after their episode drops. Do you think you oh, could, love you could spend yeah. an hour with the founders in there? Yeah, we'll love that. Whatever you need. Really? Okay, that's great. All right, we're going to do an AMA. Um, you're hiring. I know that because you just raised a bunch of money. Um, what what positions are you hiring for and where can people peruse those jobs or or hear about it? What, what What's the most pressing need right now? Yeah, so um, so we just hired a COO. Super excited about that. Um, we haven't announced it yet, but but that's that'll that'll be a big lift Super for the company. Super important for yeah, you to get yeah. your job done. Yeah, no, for sure. And, you know, we found somebody that I have a lot of faith and confidence in. Uh, and so I uh, can't wait to just, you know, operations be a people. Let me tell you something. When you get the right operations people, then all you do is just keep adding more and more incredible operators to your business as the CEO. Your life becomes amazing. Yeah. Because shit that was taking annoying shit that was taking an hour or two of your day, it just comes to you in like, a little Slack message. Uh, this is done. Yeah. And you're like, oh, that was 10 hours of my week. And it's done. Yo, we, we already, I've already realized that. Look, when I started this company, I was like, look, uh, one, I think the opportunity is inevitable. So like someone's going to build this. Like we get, we're, we're, we have a head start, right? So hopefully it's us. Um, but, you know, uh, from all of the other, you know, things that I've been a part of, the, the one and single most important thing, um, I think the misconception is that it's the idea, but it's really the talent. It's the team. Yep. So I was like, look, I'm going to I'm going to hire the most talented people, the most um, extraordinary leaders in every function that I can find. And I'm going to bet on talent. And if I get all, uh, this amazing collection of people together, like there's no there's no reason we should fail. And I went out and got guys like Neil, our CTO, who was at Headspace, was a YC founder before. I mean, he him. He alone maybe, you know, recruited 10 or Headspace 12 people to the company. Yo, Headspace has some amazing talent. I don't know if Rich, the founder, loves me given how many key people uh, on his team works at our company. I've never met him Whatever. before. Whatever. I mean, but, listen, they've been at it for imagine. like, they've been at it for six or seven years. People are fully vested and yeah, people you know, want to go on to the next people want new challenges, nature of yeah. talent, you know, as you get fully vested and maybe you want to, it, it's reasonable for somebody who is fully vested and spent five years at a company to want to then go diversify their holdings by having a four or five year stint at your company. I mean, it's yeah, yeah. I mean, and we we have an incredible culture. Um, you know, to, to your to to your point too about you know adding incredible operators. There was this one moment where Neil joined, and there was this guy that we've been interviewing, and you know we mentioned it to him, and this guy like you know runs data. He's over at Fair on their growth team, a big part of it. And he he worked at Headspace before. His name is Ryan Lee, and you know I was sort of dragging my feet because I didn't really understand what he would do, how he would add value to the company um, at that time. Um, and Neil's like, look, man, you have to just pull the trigger. Trust me now and pull the trigger on this guy. And he's going to make our life incredibly easier. Uh, he's going to add value that you can't even quantify. And we added him. Um, uh, uh, and man, Ryan Lee is just amazing. We literally call him our data guy. Like he set up our data infrastructure. He gives us insight into everything to help us make better decisions. Um, he does the same for our publishing partners. Uh, and he's just an amazing leader and spirit on our this team. This is why you got to read Ovitz's book. I mean, you can tell that you got the Ovitz influence because he talks a lot. 
what Ovitz did really well is he would bundle the talent hmm. and then he gave him leverage over the movie studio. So he'd be like, listen, I have Spielberg and I got Michael Crichton and uh, Dinosaurs. Hmm. And I got this actor and this actor and uh, here's your package. And he would bundle the talent together, right? Hmm. And it was really hard for, it was really easy for the studio to say, okay. And then he got a piece of all five of those people's oh, yeah. uh, project. And then they, when they package things like this, they got a piece of ownership in the overall project. And my understanding was Jurassic Park, that franchise kept giving CAA, you know, like, tens of millions of dollars a year just for having packaged that one franchise, right? Wow. So you just, and that's the power of like talent. And when you get those operations people, I, what I've worked on this year, or the last two years, is having all the operations people duplexed, which is a term for putting two hard drives and two hard drive controllers at a PC when I was an IT guy. But every single function has two high performing people doing the same function. And so they can alternate and they can take on other projects. And if a person's on vacation or a person were to leave, it just, the system just keeps running, like yeah. just full capacity. And when those people, when, they're, when their processors are not burning at 110%, when you put two of them on and their processors go down to 60%, they don't break. Yeah. The processors don't overheat. So yeah. they're actually running cooler, which means they enjoy the job more, which means they stay longer, which means they have more cycles to think about how to optimize this better. Right? Yeah. And that's yeah. that duplexing thing. I always tell founders like- I love that. Yeah, just try to, and and then you. I just tell people explicitly like your goal here is whatever job function you have is to have somebody who can do it as well as you or better. And then yeah. you both can then work on what's the next phase of leveling all this shit up. Yeah, it's that, it's that uh, old saying, A's hire A's, you know, B's yeah. hire C's. Yeah, always, yep. always, you know, always. optimize to find A people to hire other A people. Look, we're hiring for product and engineering, obviously. You know, some biz ops roles, a couple other operational roles. Um, you can go to playverses.com slash careers. Um, you Perfect. see some of the open roles and we'll and love to, to have Vista? you join. We're in uh we're in West LA. So we're uh, on South Barrington and Exposition. Um right right around the corner from Riot and Activision, actually. And so you can oh, wow. walk to either of their offices. South so, Barrington, I know that. So you can go out. What is that little Tokyo area it's on South Barrington? Oh, like, a Sautel. Sautel. Oh my Yo, lord. Yo, Sautel. Yo, Sautel has some amazing restaurants. You get that plan check uh, burger? Is that still there? Plan check? Oh, uh, plan check is there. So I don't get the burger, but that's amazing that you know that. And I do get sandwich? the chili cheese fries because that reminds me of Detroit. They don't yeah. taste as good and they also have beans, but like, you know, it's the closest I like the I Detroit pizza. You guys got, you got uh, some yeah, legit pizza in Detroit. Yeah, okay. no, there's some amazing. I, that's actually the one thing I miss. Um, you know, being here, the pizza's not that great in LA, but you know, we have Jets and Buddies and Bob's Pizza back in Detroit. All of those places are amazing. Deep dish pizza. Yeah, there's no. Um, I'm trying to think of any pizza in LA that's worth going to, like to drive to, and, and I think the answer is no. So I've been eating Lucifer's. I don't know if you've eaten no. that um, on Melrose and WeHo. Um, huh. and that's like the best. Like when I first moved here, you know, what is it thin crust like, or a medium crust? What kind? It's thin crust. Yeah. It's thin crust. It's, yeah. See, thin crust, thin, you can do well outside of like some places, just the medium crust or thick crust. They can't do well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think they have medium crust options too, but, uh, but yeah, everyone loves fresh brothers here too. I'm not a big fresh brothers fan. No, that's thin no. crust. The fresh brothers um, is not good. Yeah. I like, you anyway. know what I like is this high ho burger. Did you try that in Santa Monica yet? Oh, of course. Burger? Yo, listen, I used to, I used to, I it's was crazy. probably one of the first customers cause we were in science's office for, you know, wow, wow actually like nuts. I started, I started in a, like a closet next to Mike Jones's assistant with like yeah. five or six other companies. And then, you know, now we're in a 17,000 square foot building, really beautiful. Um, and, uh, and you know, when Hi Ho first opened, like I would go there, um, take a bird scooter down there and just like, you know, like literally live in that Santa Monica lifestyle. Yo, I would love, burger. I would, on the on the lime scooter, the bird scooter. <laughs> no, uh, uh, the are place you next to it, Wovo, is line. also very good. The, what, the pasta place. The pasta. I think it's the same owner, by the same way. Same owner, it is. Yeah, there's the same yeah. as Sugarfish and uh, the the Nizawa Sugarfish roll. is right across the street too. Yeah, yeah. Are you are you an investor in Bird or Lime? I'm I'm not an investor in either of those. I'm an investor in Uber. Okay, cool. Well, that's even better. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think Uber is going to run over those. So to yeah, speak. I'm a, no, I'm I think a that Uber winds up buying Bird eventually. My friends are all the investors in Bird. I think Bird wins. Yeah. Um, I think Bird is a great business. I think it should be a subscription business. I think they this consumption base is the wrong model. 
And the, but I think they're, they they built like that 3.0 scooter, so they build their own hardware now. Yeah. So it doesn't break in three months. It's not like off the yeah. shelf. And the batteries work better. And I think if they just made it a subscription where people paid, you know, 20, 30, 40, or 50 for, you know, unlimited, whatever, or you can keep the scooter at your house. Yeah. Then I think they could get, you know, oh man, I, I just like you're doing subscriptions where people don't have to think about consu- one of the things I love about subscription businesses because we invested in Calm, Steezy, the dance mm. company, which is in downtown LA, and yeah. Fitbod. Those are our, I think, three biggest right now in subscriptions. And you can charge a low price and give massive value and still build a really sustainable business. Yeah. It becomes very sustainable because if your people are getting value, you can keep adding to the product but keep the price the same. Yeah. That's the magic to me. Like if you're charging $64 for a season, they do two seasons, that's 130 bucks. If you just made it $99 a year, unlimited seasons, yeah. and then you added like special weekend events or one-offs or whatever, mini seasons, brackets, and it's just the same price. People are like, these people are idiots. It's $99 and it keeps getting better, which is what's yeah. happening with Disney. You think about the Disney library, every time they do Clone Wars, every time they do Mandalorian, the archive gets richer and richer, but yeah. it's the same goddamn price. Yeah. I mean, we, we're, we're, we're experimenting with our business model. I think we want to go to a uh, sort of school site fee. So, you know, find a way to drive enough value between five and $10,000. Uh, on average per school. Um, uh, and I think the the comp there is a, a company called Huddle, H-U-D-L. Yeah. For they're me. a video analysis platform and they're 99% of the high schools. I think their average, you know. I would also just let people off the street 000. just buy it for a hundred bucks a month. Yeah, so we're going to do that too. So we're, we're moving, we want to move. Because then our, you get the bottom our, up, right? Like if I want to do it in my school, yeah, exactly. we just all do a hundred bucks and you set it up for them, boom. So we want to do, so essentially how we think about it is like different product solutions. And so our scholastic business between high school and college, you plan on behalf of these schools, let the, the schools pay for that. And then as a consumer or player, you can do other forms of competition, um, uh, you know, for some sort of Amazon Prime type subscription. And maybe you bundle that with different IPs and like, you know, that drives the cost down for those additional IPs. But, uh, but, uh, but yeah, we're, we're looking into a bunch of different ideas there. There's a, there's a, there's a, it's a lot of value already packed into that $64 beyond just being able to compete for a state championship, but you end up getting neither the game or the contents of the game for free. So in our deals with the publishers, um, you know, something that might cost all of the contents of the game that might cost you 5,000 hours or, or a thousand bucks to purchase, you get all of that for free uh, when you play. So that's a platform. lot of value. Yeah. So a ton of value. I mean, or you get the game, right? That costs 60 bucks for free. So, um, and it's only $64. And so and we don't pay the publishers anything for that value um, because we're driving so much value back to, to their, their esports programming do these kids use email or just their mobile phone like do you have their email addresses are they starting yeah to get so into email email, email and mobile phone yeah yeah see i think this sms communication is i've been thinking about it with inside i built a little gateway and i'm thinking like just getting your news like five times a day on sms could be a thing yeah just oh bing, no bing, for bing. sure kids are they certainly are way more engaged on sms or discord than uh than, than email, but you know, obviously we have to. I heard to also there's a Discord them. server with like there's Discord servers with like fifty to a hundred thousand people. Oh, easily, yo, Discord. Have you had Jason on the show yet? No, somebody locked Man. that up. I'll, I'll introduce you if you want. Yeah, yeah, um, please. I was just talking to him earlier this week uh, through email. He, uh, man, Jason's an amazing dude. Runs an incredible company. They're probably 250, 300 million users uh, within the last few years. Um, uh, and they're they're. I don't know who's going to buy them, but I know it's going to be for a lot of money. And so it's got to um, be Amazon. It's gotta be Amazon. Yeah, no, so Amazon bought Curse. So the budget, you know, they probably couldn't, Twitch probably couldn't unlock that much budget for Discord. It probably cost them a couple billion dollars. So they end up buying the, you know, the original sort of Discord called Curse for just probably a few hundred million. Um, but yeah, like- Is uh, it growing or no since they bought it? I think they've, I think they've sunsetted it, if I'm not mistaken. I oh, think they gotta they just go buy, they gotta bite the bullet and buy Discord and then just bundle it with Twitch, right? Yo, Discord, yeah. I mean, that'd be that'd be an incredible, you know, family Combo. of companies. Yeah, it's like With Disney Amazon. buying Marvel and Pixar and Star Wars. You start putting these things together. Oh yeah, I think uh, or Facebook. Like I, you know, the guy who one of the former Facebook heads can't buy of Discord. Anything. Facebook's not allowed. They're in the penalty box. Oh, okay, that's fair. Uh, I mean, look, Facebook uh, has Although been trying Trump to build might different- let them go because you know they love Trump. Hey, look, I have no comment on that. I didn't take money from investors who were public supporters of Trump. To be honest with you. You know, I was, uh, and, no, I mean, you, you know, have to stand for something or you fall for anything. Like you get, I mean, it, there's people who can't come out and be like, I am for this person. Like yeah. Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg were supporting Hillary. Yeah. Peter Thiel was supporting Trump. Okay, fine. Peter Thiel yeah. speaks at the convention. Yeah. Sheryl Sandberg and Zuckerberg say nothing. 
They wouldn't even do any, all behind the scenes. They were not publicly coming out in a major way for Hillary because they're so scared of losing any users on their platform. Yeah. It's just like pathetic. It's like stand for something. Like pick your candidate. It's America. You can have a candidate. Why are you yeah, so the, scared for well, money? Well, the challenge is like you can't separate um, the identity of the, the the person or the entrepreneur from the uh, from the company, you know, especially a guy like Zuck or even or even Sheryl Sandberg, um, uh, even though she's not the founder. Um, and so, yeah, look, I get I get it. That's a challenge. I mean, that's a challenge for 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 me too, or you and any anybody I else. I make um, I make my feelings known. I don't want I I'd rather have like twenty percent less audience. If some people's people are going to judge me because of I want to participate in the American process of elections and tell yeah. you about it and, and state my position, like we should be able to state our positions in America and not have people be like, well, then I'm not going to ever use your service. Like, I'm not going to yeah. listen to This Week in Startups because you're pro Bloomberg. I got so much blowback when I made Bloomberg my avatar on Twitter. And hmm. I was like, listen, I want Bloomberg in there. I know Mike. He's super qualified. We need somebody who can operate us out of this mess. I did like you, my did Bloomberg. you think he had a really good, sh I mean, did you think he had a fair shot to even, even win? Obviously, I think if he started know. earlier, he would have. He got, you know, he was up at 20% at one point. Yeah, he if definitely he had started earlier, he would have. He started too late. Yeah. But I he's mean, the most what, qualified out of the group. I mean, look, I'm not really that excited about any of the politicians that have uh, that have thrown their hat in the ring to be president. Um, oh, you know, if disaster. I could, we if we could just go back to Obama, um, that would work for you me. You know, and let him groom a groom a you know a, a cabinet of, of you know young leaders. Like I think that'd be our best bet. Yeah, I'm just. It's so weird that after all of this, we're left with like a 78 year old guy who. Doesn't feel super sharp. Like, I don't, can this guy even do a second term? Like, there should be something. I, I almost feel like there should be an upper age limit or a mental oh, acuity sure. test. Like, maybe seventy five is the limit. Yeah, I mean, look, I think we should, we should, we should probably try to optimize for for youth and our presidents because they're closer and more relatable to just what society looks like today. So, you know, that's what we have 40, to flip. I agree. Forty to sixty, you know, something like that. Um, you yeah, know, I think it's super difficult to be you know, um, electing people who are 75, 78, 80 years old to be president. Like 50, sure to, have 50 some. to 60, 50 to 65, you're still that sharp. Right. You got enough wisdom. Yeah. And you know who you are. You've had enough life behind you. That seems that 50 to 65 seems like a real good window to me. Yeah. Look, I think, uh, I think above that is just super challenging. Like, you know, we're concerned about, especially in, you know, look at this pandemic, like we have to be concerned about our president's health. Um, yeah. And so that's why, you know, whom their vice president is becomes even more important and right. who the other leaders surrounding them are becomes super important. And so, you know, I certainly think that we should start um, going in, the, you know, in the direction of trying to, you know, optimize for younger, more savvier, that could be more the, relatable leaders. This could be the move for Biden. Biden should say, listen, I'm going to serve out as much as a term as I can. And I got this incredible number two. And think of us as partners. At some point, I may retire at some point, you know. If I, uh, for the second term, maybe I just hand it off, whatever it is. But, you know, this is going to be a collaboration. He should just name his entire cabinet now and just yeah. come out and be like, look at the all stars. Here's an all star team. That's why I think Bob Iger should be in there. Yeah. Oh, that'd Disney. be interesting. Did you read Who Bob you Iger's book yet? I haven't. I haven't. But, uh, Ooh, so but I, look, Bob Iger is a legend. Yeah. No, deep respect. Super I was actually operator. very surprised. Super surprised when he stepped down. Um, well, he's, uh, and he's, I was he's also done surprised. it all. He's done it all, man. You got to read this book. His, his bio is incredible. Who, what, are you, what are your thoughts on uh, on Travis Kalanick? Uh, you know, it's I my know guy. I know he's very polarizing. It's my guy. That's my guy. Yeah, I love. Greatest, I love he's going to be one of the greatest. One of he'll, he'll go down as the greatest CEO, one of the greatest CEOs of our generation of all time. He sees it five years before everybody, and he is um, relentlessly focused, and he can solve every problem. And he's not afraid to to mix it up if he needs to. Give me your top five. Top five entrepreneurs. Travis and Elon. Uh, right up there up top. I mean, those guys just are unstoppable, the forces of nature. Um, after that, I think Alex and Michael from Calm are just an incredible team. Hmm. Uh, you know, the Robin Hood team, Vlad, uh, is pretty amazing. I'm talking my own book here for those two, but uh, who else on that list? You know, you have to appreciate what Zuckerberg did but I don't like the way he did it, so I can't yeah. put him on my list. I don't think he's all that creative or bright, I'll be totally honest. Um, I think he just copies people real well, so I don't give him any credit for that, but he's really good at copying. I like Kevin Sistrom um, from, from Instagram. Instagram. I think he yeah. got that. Uh, he figured it out really so, well. So too early, man. Yeah, way, Classic way story. too early. Way too early, yeah. yeah. Who's, I who's guess it's hard, list? right? Because 
because he could have been Kevin Rose, right? Who didn't sell early enough. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's hard. It's Timing is just hard. You know, yeah. th- here's the thing. If you know it's working and you love doing it, don't stop. Kevin Rose, people got in his head and it was too much pressure for him, I think. And he couldn't just stay focused on iterating. And if you look at Reddit, Reddit just kept going. They didn't yeah. like do some like huge thing and try to be what they weren't. They just kept going. And sometimes if you don't quit, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And compounding interest, you know, it just something becomes very big. Even without the founders, it just kept growing. And then the founders took it back over and it kept going. And yeah. Reddit's kind of like this like juggernaut. It won't go away and it just keeps baking and growing. Who's in your yeah. I, I pick top five of like current CEOs. I could go back. You know, yeah. and obviously I would pick, you know, some other people if I was going backwards. But who's in your top yeah. five right now? Stuart Butterfield, Slack. Slack's um, legit. Yeah, big, big Stuart fan. Um, Travis, obviously. Um, yeah. I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm in my office. I hadn't used my home office until, you know, the last few weeks because our office is so close to my home. And so I'm designing it and like decorating it. Yeah. And I have some art coming and Travis is going to be on the wall right behind me, uh, him and a, a handful of other entrepreneurs. Um, Love it. Uh, but because uh, big, big Do you Travis know Travis fan. or no? No, I don't. I, right, I saw I'll him at Soho up. House once, but uh, I'll set he's just up. a beast, man. Yeah, he's big a beast. respect. He's for beast him. mode. Um, he's he's beast mode. He, yeah. Right now, he's just not doing any press. He just head down working yeah. on cloud kitchens. Yeah, and talk about timing. He sold all of his Uber shares. Everybody's like, yeah. "Oh, well, that was a stupid trade," and then the market collapses. So he looks smart. Now he's going to deploy all that cash yeah. in a down market. He's, it's going to be like one of the most brilliant trades of all time. Yeah. I mean, look, I think the the one thing from reading Super Pump, from talking to people and even hiring people you know, who were early at Uber, it's like if he could have got culture and HR right, investor relations right, you know, probably you know, he's probably not is not in, he's probably still even at Uber um, today. Don't, don't um, be surprised. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Don't be surprised. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. But I, I, I'd say Surprise, Travis Steve Stewart, Jobs did it. Why can't Travis? That's true. I, I guess interest. He has to be interested in it. Um, no, I, don't, but, I think what's going to happen is I think at some point the board's going to be like, OK, Dara took this this far. Yeah. And it's a it's you know, it's growing, but we need to own cloud kitchens and we need yeah, that exactly. guy back in the seat. Yeah. And then they'll I be mean, like, Dara was a good steward of the brand and he got it, you know, to whatever, sixty bucks a share and yeah. It's stable and he got it through this weather storm, but let's get that guy back. And when the board yeah. flips over a couple of times, it's gonna kinda be like Steve Jobs back and they're like, you know what? There was some magic here. Cause look at Uber now. They're like People are like, okay, they're managing the business. It's getting- They're not you know, even aggressive anymore. There, there's no aggressiveness. They're just like, you know yeah. what? Let's just get to profitability. We don't need to launch new products. Let's just make these products great, which I understand. That's what the public stock market wants. Yeah. But if Travis was there, he'd be like, what can we buy? What can we build? How do we get this going more aggressive? And I think Dara is like just a great operator. So it, yeah. it reduces the downside risk, which is important because people thought that Uber was going to be a zero and fly off the rails. Yeah. There's no way Dara's going to let that happen. He's going to run the business properly. So you remove the downside risk, but you cap the upside. Yeah. Yeah, right? no, for sure. I'm 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 super long on Uber. Um, super long. Good. Yeah. Makes me feel yeah, good. No, so uh, but, uh so, so so Travis Stewart, um uh uh Jay Z, obviously, like yeah, totally so many parallels, one of the best entrepreneurs um ever uh especially given just the circumstances he hasn't obviously done a lot in tech but just you know a brilliant mind don't think he um, needs to uh yeah well I, you know hopefully he does though because it'd be it'd be good to see you know black culture and hip-hop we always you know talk about and promote entrepreneurship but we're not actually supporting and standing next to the people who are building this sort of next wave of companies leveraging technology which it's is really the like future and so a lot of false starts like carmelo started his thing nas start nas started his thing yeah everybody's kind of dabbled a little bit um but i think like if you just look at instagram and who the top users are yeah like instagram is black culture yeah no for sure yeah and twitter is black culture twitter was black culture so much that they They had to change how trending (laughs) topics works i don't know if you know that story oh i didn't know that i've told this story before um this is like inside information that um uh, the African American community was having so much fun trending shit on Twitter that mm. the rest of Twitter would see all these trends and not understand them. Oh, wow. And they're like, okay, I don't understand what's trending. And I, I click on it and I still kind of don't understand it. Yeah. So then they were like, okay, we're going to customize trending topics to your location and to who you follow. 
Oh, wow. And they rebooted it because, and it, it happens to me sometimes, like, I don't know if you have this happen where K-pop just takes over your trending topics. No, that, that never happens to so me. So I have K-pop, because <laughs> I'm in San Francisco, I think K-pop's very big here, and like all of a sudden yeah. I get all these K-pop stuff, and I'm like, oh my God, who are these people? Like, I, I don't, is there a turn boy band off? Because all these fans of the boy bands, and there's five members of the band, and there's three or four songs, and then there's the three or four people they're dating. So all of a sudden, mm. 20, of this, your top 20, 15, and I'm like, you can't ban... I'd have to know each of the. What is the name of the? What is it? BTS. Oh yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard of that group. I've never listened. to I think to it's any BTS is the big yeah, group. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I gotta. I'm literally thinking of looking up the names of each of the people to mute. Oh, BTS. just to mute that keyword. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I definitely am a, a, a mute profiles from certain people. I'll mute keywords. Um, Mute's the best yeah, because you no, can like people are like, oh, you're following me. It's like absolutely. Look, I, I'm a massive Twitter fan. I'm I'm so disappointed, and um, you know, just you know, where they are today. I think they should have been a lot bigger, uh, and certainly more impactful and influential in in today's you know society. You know, for sure, given the influence of the product. Some some of that is obviously the back and forth on management. Um, obviously, Dick came in and really helped you know grow that company. They sort of lost a lot of product vision after that. Um, uh, they haven't really iterated on the product that much. They haven't you know necessarily. You know, Jack is too. To like cerebral i think i think he's great at like architecting and conceiving of the product yeah but i don't think he has that aggressive zuckerberg or travis or elon ambition yeah and so i think his ambition is to not break it and to maybe yeah, do fair. other things yeah and i like jack a lot and it's fine that's running it's his company so he started it uh, yeah he should have uh well he needs to get whomever at square like he needs to find his equivalent from square because i mean square super aggressive on the product front uh, yeah, and they uh, they're just they're just you know I love Square as a company. You know, Disney uh, almost bought Twitter. And uh, in the I didn't book, know that. Bob Iger explains why he backed out. They literally had a wow. deal; it was approved on both sides. And like days before they were going to announce it, he was like, "I don't want to deal with all of the hate speech, policing hmm. speech, bots, and the political ramifications." Was like the straw that broke the back, like this thing swinging elections. I don't yeah. want to be the person who has to just because remember he had um, Roseanne Barr say this like crazy offensive shit oh, on there, yeah. racist stuff, and then you had Trump, you know, yeah. like, his shit, and like, just he's like, I, this is the antithesis That's of the lot. Disney brand. Yeah, and he had to just get out. Like social media does not work for the Disney brand. It's just not controllable uh, and family friendly. Yeah. No, uh, I know Twitter was supposed to buy Twitch um, before yep. Amazon or, and Instagram. or Google did. Yeah, and they and they and they had a product. They hired a head of product, and I, I don't I don't know who he is, but didn't believe in it. And so, well, look they, how they, they fucked up they Vine too. With. Yeah, they should they sunsetted Vine because of cost. And and look at TikTok today. Look at it, Vine, today. TikTok is Vine. Yeah, no, I mean even even if you think about like behaviors on on Instagram, like uh, Vine and all of the biggest the people who help. Uh, popularized Instagram were a lot of original Vine stars. Yes. Um, and then and you look at Melvin Gray, Periscope. Guys. Yeah. Now uh, Instagram Live is totally that could have been, Periscope. Yo, and that could have been, that could have also been House Party too. You yep. know, uh, even though like the Meerkat guys went on the final House Party, but like they were on to a, a good trend with like social video um, and broadcasting. Um, See, this is, yeah. having a house of brands is what Twitter should do. And then to have yeah. a house of brands, you need a leader slightly different than Jack. You need somebody who can manage eight personalities who are yeah. running eight distinct businesses that share a common architecture, which is the at handle. Yeah. I would run the shit out of that because I would just be like, I put eight people in charge. I'd bring them in for quarterly meetings. They would pitch to each other what they're doing, what their performance is. And then I would just fire whoever the bottom person was and I would give more money to the top two people. Yeah. And I yeah. would just run it like Lord of the Flies, like Game of Thrones. I mean, in some ways, you know, Facebook has done a little bit of that. Um, of course, less yeah. connectivity across the brands, but um, but yeah, for sure, I think you know Zuck has done a good job at um, you know picking picking early winners, best acquirer, and, yeah, and and putting resources behind them and integrating them within the Facebook ecosystem and and then leveraging all of the you know growth network that he has. To, to I grow actually them. think Jeff Bezos is maybe the best entrepreneur of this time. Dude, I was about to say, so my fourth is Jeff Bezos. He's probably my number one in general. He's definitely uh, my Rushmore. Yeah. Yeah, and my fifth is uh is probably a toss between uh Drew at Dropbox or, or Brian at Airbnb. Um, yeah, uh, love both Brian, of those guys. I love both of those guys. Brian is just I the 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 back channel on Airbnb right now. Is, it's tough. They were too scared to go public, and they're too scared to do the layoffs. Yeah, and that that loan that he took, man, a lot of a lot of it's a heavy interest rate. 
well, I mean, why wouldn't you lay off half the team if the business is going to be demolished? Like he just, I mean, there's, there's loyalty to your team yeah. and then there's running the company off the cliff. And I, how does this thing go public now? Well, brand. Yeah. He's a, uh, I think, I think, you know, that's a, be a, a terrible brand hit and that's just not like the Airbnb way. Like they don't believe in that. Yeah. It's just, it's, I think it's going to be the, the back channel from people I know who are shareholders in that company is like a massive high level of frustration that they didn't get the company out public. Yeah. They didn't they get that. And they could have easily. So they were scared to go public is what somebody told me on the inside. They yeah. just, they didn't want to be under the scrutiny or whatever. And then now all these options have to be regranted. You got these crazy loans. Like it is a really dicey situation there. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, uh, do you think there's room for a, a startup to come in and disrupt them when things go back? 100. To, 100. To I actually have the idea. Oh, well. It's, have, e uh, it's a really simple idea, I think. Instead of taking a carry fee, you know how it's a membership fee? Yeah. Or, I'm sorry, a percentage fee. I make it a yeah. membership fee. So you pay depending on the price of your Airbnb. If your Airbnb is $100 or less a night, you pay um, uh, 100 bucks a month to be on the platform. If your Airbnb yeah. is between 100 and 300 you pay 250 basically one night a month. This is to the host, right? To the host. Yeah. And the host pay a subscription fee and there's no other fees. Oh, yeah. I mean, I wonder how many hosts they have. That So the number well, of properties they have- Well, it would wind up being depends. millions. So yeah. you, I mean, if you think about your subscription business you're talking about, yeah. you want to hit 100 million. Well, this would be a million, but instead of paying, you know, 100, you having 100 million paying $100 a year would be 10 billion. This yeah. is a million people a year paying 2,000 or 1,000 a year on average or 2,000 a year on average. Yeah. You know, you get to a lot of money. That would be a very disruptive way to do it. And then you could figure out other ways to add services on. Yeah, no, they, uh, it's just, uh, it's probably just a little bit smaller than their their current vision. Hmm. But but I definitely see that as an opportunity to have predictable revenue. Um, or maybe they make that even as an option to start um, to say, look, you can, you can either do transactions or you can do this subscription, just give them some consistent predictable revenue, especially during downturns That's what like I'm this. You I think Twitch, it. Twitch has like one of the most robust business models, right? Between like advertising, subscription tips, like all of those things that they baked in, yeah. even Twitch Prime, like uh, their business model is just so great. Um, I'm also surprised that like Instagram is a... Uh, has uh, not you know monetized or built creator tools right now. Like they, people should be monetizing their like Instagram. Absolutely, lives. they should be YouTube. Um, they should just go heads yo, up against man. YouTube. They should give everybody who's doing live should be able to put ads in their stream. So when they need to Easy. take a bathroom break, they Easy. do a, they do an ad, and they should just give a hundred percent of the advertising in streams to people. That's what if I was running Instagram, I'd say all the ad revenue you get 90 percent goes to you when you're or running streams. How many streams would there be? Yo, I think there's like uh so I've been watching versus. I don't know if you've seen these, yes. but these are like yeah, the two two artists kind of battle it out. Yep. Yo, like uh four million people tuned in to Teddy. Well, I was Riley also watching the other one where people were dancing. Oh yeah, so that was the first one. That, that was <laughs> yeah. That was crazy. Uh, yeah. No, there's there's a big opportunity around that. I mean, like if you if, if it was just behind a paywall, like pay per view style, like yes. you know, that's big revenue. And people right now, especially, would have like you know For did sure. that you know imagine like david dobrik like he's not he's not even making youtube yeah. videos but if he got on live and like just talked and he had a he could do advertising or, or put a paywall for like some sort of subscription to that content like millions of kids would be i just think it's all going to go subscription advertising yeah. just is so hard to do like yeah. if you get to scale like people are like oh you should make this week in startups subscription and like it's like well i'm doing something different i'm using this podcast to to get deal flow um, and because I'm interested in doing it and it makes seven figures in revenue. So that's fine. It pays for everything. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to go backwards once you hit scale. Like Joe Rogan can't go backwards. But for new stuff like the athletic, it's like if you build it from the bottom up paid. Love that. And athletic. it's high quality. And it's like, well, do I want to read information like, too? the information? But do you want to read yeah. like some dipshit writing about the Knicks? Or do you want somebody who's actually like getting paid a lot of money or a decent amount to just obsess over the Knicks? Yeah. You know? And R.J. Barrett or whatever, you know. Yeah, no, that's a. Oh, I know you're a big Nick. You're gonna be a future owner of the Knicks. Uh, Listen, Knicks are undefeated during coronavirus. <laughs> so this is the one silver lining for me. We're undefeated. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I and I hope James Dolan is okay. By the way, I, yeah, you know, a lot no, of Knicks sure. fans were cracking jokes, and I know it's like it's. Funny I hope to, they hash it out with Spike Lee too, because that's kind of ridiculous. That's why um, I, I mean, the, the, the whole thing with Oakley to me, like Oakley should when Oakley comes to the Garden. Everybody should bow their heads and give him a standing ovation. And when 
when they when he gets up to take a leak, there should be a standing ovation. That's yeah, that's how I feel about up. Charles Oakley. Yeah, him and Lee, Spike Lee. I think uh, both of them deserve apologies and they deserve free tickets. I've gone um, in that entrance, by the way. I, I know the entrance he goes in. I've I've gone through there with people like when I knew Alan Houston when uh, he was a Nick. Yeah. Um, and I became friends with Alan Houston. Uh, he would take me through that entrance. It's just basically like there's the VIP entrance and then there's this like, you know, service. It's a service entrance. Yeah. And Spike Lee used to go through the service entrance until like, the guys had courtside seats. You know how much money he's paid for those seats? Man, five thousand a pop. Yeah, it's expensive. He's got two of them. It's ten grand a game. That's four hundred thousand yeah. a year. And if the Knicks ever made the playoffs, it would be even more. Yeah. Yo, last thing too, Collison yeah. Brothers, man, like they're phenomenal. Um, yeah. uh, they have to be. They're going to end up on that list. Um, uh, and so maybe I'll, I'll throw them in. I know that's yeah. more than five, but like shout out to those guys. Shout I actually out. wish that uh. Me and my brother could have built a, a company like that one day. Uh, just a big company. I think company. you got the right thing right now. I think you'll make it work. I think just anybody being able to come up and participate. Like I love the idea of the foothold of where you are. Yeah. And then I love the idea of anybody else who wants to participate can participate because some people don't have schools that are big enough. They only have seven kids in the school who want to do it. They don't have enough critical mass. Or then kids graduate too, right? Yeah, and then they want to continue to play. Hey, so surprisingly though, we right now we're just three games live. We're gonna add. We'll probably be six or seven games this fall. But uh, thirty to fifty kids will try out um, for those three games. Um, wow! Uh, and you know the coach will build teams around that. If you think about that relative to other sports, um, uh, you know only on average thirty kids play baseball and basketball per school. Twenty seven play. Um, uh, uh, ice hockey. So this um, could be like triple, uh, ten yeah, times. Football is seventy four. Look, if one, you know, football is one point one million kids a year who play across fourteen thousand schools. Yeah, seventy four kids dangerous. in schools. Um, yeah, and it's dangerous. Um, and obviously, like particularly this of all, like they're like esports is the safest option. I would. I mean, yeah. I understand why people love the sport and it's exciting to watch, but I would never let my child play. I would yeah, do so everything I could to stop them from playing, knowing what I saw in that frontline documentary about the brain lesions. Yeah. That Look, I think there's I think get. that, you know, it's it's going it's trending down. Um it'll it'll probably still be one of the more popular sports in high school for, you know, at least the next few decades. They got to reconfigure it. Yeah, but esports is going to be just as dominant. I think we'll we'll be 2 to 3 million kids at some point um in high school and, and probably in every high school similarly to like how basketball. Basketball, most people would assume football is in every high school, but basketball actually has the most adoption um at that sort of per school level. Uh and I think esports has an opportunity to follow that. And uh and then we'll, you know, it's important that we nail Scholastic because nailing Scholastic gives us those relationships with the publishers and we're adding value back to their strategic planning. And then we can leverage that to go do other things, build new businesses with the publishers, um, with integration, with relationship. Um, you know, and, and have better margins, you know, um, on whatever that ref share looks like on those new products we build together. And because of that relationship, they'll, we'll just like funnel users from their client or their con, like their platform directly to play versus. And we don't have to, you know, spin up, you know, a hundred million dollar paid ad campaign to get those users. And so, look, I think, um, you know, our strategy is working. We're super grateful to have raised, you know, almost 100 million in 13 months um, to be only, you know, over a little bit over two years old and be as successful as we are. And, and yo, again, just thank you for, for you know, doing the oh. Launch Festival, for giving me opportunity. I mean, I literally it was not indirectly. even in the show notes and nobody knew that that was part of the story. But listen, congratulations. Everybody go work uh, at Play Versus. Sounds like a dope company to work at. And you're probably getting it on the ground level. Continued success. And thanks for helping me get uh, Mr. Ovitz on the pod. Yeah, 100%. And Jason from Discord. And Jason from Discord. Okay. All right. We'll see you all next time. Stay safe, everybody.